Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Tom Fontana. I'm Director of Research and Education with the Ohio Soybean Council. On behalf of Ohio's 24,000 soybean farmers, thank you for joining us today for a very special virtual tour of Wine and Candies in Piqua, Ohio. Uh, Wine and's is celebrating their 60th anniversary in the chocolate business this year. Uh, Wilson Reiser, the grandson of the founder, is the chief executive officer. And joining us today is the chief operating officer, Amy Snyder. Uh, Amy has worked for the company for 24 years and has been fortunate to grow up in the company and really learn all that's associated with uh, the candy business and the growth of the company. When she started in 1997, Winans had two locations and they now have 20 retail locations all around the state with the 21st opening in the next month or so. So it's uh, nice to have them as a partner today. So on behalf of the Ohio Soybean Council, uh, our education platform, grownextgen.org, which I encourage you to uh, use with your students in your classroom, and uh, our partners at educationprojects.org. Thanks for joining us for this tour today. Please ask questions. You can put them in the chat box uh, in the Q&A uh, section on Zoom. I have some questions that were submitted prior uh, to the uh, field trip today. We'll try to get through the, as many of those as possible. So feel free to ask as many questions as you would like. With that, I'll turn it over to Amy and thank you very much for having us today. Hi guys, welcome to Winans. I'm happy to have you here today in a little bit different format than we usually give tours virtually. Um, I'm joining you from our candy kitchen and uh, we're gonna play a little video. I wanna talk to you about Wilson is Max's grandson, the founder. And so I wanted you guys to be able to meet him virtually because he's not gonna be able to be here today. Winans Carriage House Candies is a family story. My grandfather, Max Winans, grew up in his family's bakeries. His hobby, making chocolates. Lucky for all of us, in 1961, he turned his hobby into his profession when he opened Winans Carriage House Candies right here in Piqua, Ohio. So uh, this morning I was at my desk and I was looking at the attendee list for today for the first time. And I was so excited because I saw some familiar names from around the community and then some all around the state. But um, there were people joining from local tech high schools around here, the Career Center. Uh, there were teams from Spring Creek Primary. And I saw some teachers that my kids had when they went to Spring Creek Primary not too long ago. So I'm so happy you could be with us today. So let's get this tour started, OK? Um, it is not Willy Wonka in the Chocolate Factory, but we're still going to have a lot of fun. So I am in our candy kitchen here, and you're going to get to see a few things. I'm going to talk about the equipment that we use. So right now we have a caramel that is cooking. We, um, this caramel cooker and all the equipment that you're going to see in the video, uh, Max bought in 1961, and we still use it every single day. Uh, the caramel is being cooked in a copper kettle. We use copper because it evenly distributes heat. And so it's very easy for us to work with. We don't have to stir it as much. Our caramel that you see cooking there takes about an hour from start to finish. And um, a one to two degree temperature change at the end, if you don't pull the caramel off in time, makes the difference between a good batch of caramel and a not great batch of caramel. Uh, we're going to see our Hobart mixer here. Hobart is one of the leading food manufacturing equipment companies. It's located in Troy, Ohio, not too far from here. I know we have some people on from Troy. And um, this is the oldest working Hobart mixer in the world. It is from 1913. And we use it to make cookie dough and we use it to make marshmallow. It is a workhorse for us. It never breaks. It's just one of those great pieces of machinery that always work for you. Um, a couple of things about our kitchen and the things that when the candies start, our centers start back here is that we use really good high quality ingredients. So we use real butter, we use heavy cream, we use real fruit purees. 
So for instance, our raspberry cream has real raspberry fruit puree in it. And we've started partnering with a Ohio Dairy Snowville Creamery, and we're using their heavy cream in all of our um, wrapped caramel kisses. So um, that's one of the things I think that makes us different is the ingredients that we use. Um, we also have a cool um, kind of science ingredient we use. So when I was thinking about this tour and thinking about food science, I never really thought that much about how everything that we do here is food science and related to science. And so one of the ingredients sometimes that we'll put in is Invertase. So Invertase is a live enzyme that helps to break sugar down. And it comes in in liquid form, syrup form, or powder form. Um, we use it, a great example is in our cherry cordials. So our cherry cordials have a white sugar fondant on the outside of the red cherry when they're going down the enrobing line. And at that point, the sugar fondant is pretty hard and there aren't a lot of cherry juices that are on the cherries. And the reason for that is you couldn't run a really messy red cherry down the line, right? That would be a disaster. So we drain the cherries. We put the sugar fondant on them and then they get covered in chocolate. Now, once they're covered in chocolate, that's kind of where the science happens. So the Invertase, the enzyme breaks down the sugar and makes it a really nice liquid sugar that mixes with the juices from the cherry. So that's when you bite into a chocolate cherry. That's why it's a really ju juicy liquid experience. Um, I always tell people that cherry cordial is the one piece that you don't want to eat off the end of the enrobing line. All of us that work here know the insider tip is to get the candy right as it's coming off the end of the belt, right? Like I love Lucy style. Um, but Chocolate cherries are better the older that they get. So let them sit for a month, two months, and then you're going to let the Ember taste do the work and it's going to taste great. Um, the question I wanted to address that someone submitted before I take some other questions here is they ask about food safety and how we handle that. And Food safety has become a very large part of our business here at Wine and So some of that is because we've grown so much. Over the years, we've become a much larger company. And some of that is because of a law that is Food Safety Modernization Act called FISMA. And what FISMA requires is no matter your size of your business, you still have to have the same type of safety, food safety mechanisms in place. So we have a person that works for us now who's biggest part of her job is to make sure that we're compliant with food safety. So what does that mean? A few things. So right off the bat, it means making sure that our surfaces are differentiated between food contact and no food contact surfaces. So um, we have ability to trace products, lock coding, traceability all the way back to the ingredient level. So if there is a peanut butter delight on my shelf, I know what in what peanut butter and what exact ingredients were in it. It also means um, having a recall plan in place. It also means um, making sure that you have nutritional information. So nutritional information deadline is the end of this year. We have been working on it for years and we are in the final stages and we'll be able to have nutritional information on our packaging very, very soon. So those are just a few of the ways that we are in compliance with the Food Safety and Modernization Act. Um, it definitely changed the way that we do business. We do chemical, like we do swabbing now for bacteria and things like that too. So um, I can answer any other questions that you might have as we walk to our next venue. Okay. Well, uh, here's, here's one for you. What's the difference between milk chocolate and dark chocolate? Great. So the difference is the amount of um, basically milk and sugar that gets put in it. That's what makes the difference. Um, Americans have always kind of been more drawn to milk chocolate. It's sweeter, doesn't have what most people would say is a kind of a bitter tone to it. But in this time that I've been working at Wine Inns, we've seen a huge increase in the dark chocolate sales in the industry. So at Wine Inns, we're about 60% milk chocolate sales and 40% dark chocolate sales. I uh, have a couple related questions here, Amy. How many pieces of candy do you make a day and how much chocolate do you make in a day? Yeah, so pieces of candy, I would have to do the math on a calculator, <laughs> but um, we can run about 500 pounds per line per day. 
Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that when we get over to the enrobing lines, but we can run quite a bit of chocolate out of this one smaller size manufacturing company in one shift. Okay, very good. How many different types of chocolate do you make? Yeah, we have about 35 different varieties right now that we make. And honestly, they're pretty much the same that Max started with in 1961. Um, we've added a couple and taken away a couple, but for the most part, they're still all the same. Very good. Um, we also had several questions about uh, uh, your environmental commitments there at Wine yeah. That's great, good question. And we're actually, can you remind me, we're gonna talk about it at the end of the tour because I wanna talk okay. about it during the packaging portion because that's kind of where I think the most impact will be had, but it's definitely something that we are focused on and working toward every day. So I can speak to it a little bit more then. Okay, very good. Thank you. Uh, let's cool. move on to the next area. Okay. So these are what we would call our tables. So everything from the kitchen that you saw comes out to either these tables or it goes through a former or depositor so that it can get from its liquid shape into a more set up shape that we can work with. So what um, you're seeing right now are caramels on the table. Um, so the caramel that you saw cooking would look like this once it got poured on the table. One of the great examples I think of tabling is peanut brittle. Um, peanut brittle is, uh, has a chemical reaction that's a food science thing, and then it also has a fun thing about the table. So we add baking soda at the very end of the cooking process for peanut brittle. And when we add the baking soda in, it has this really cool chemical reaction where it bubbles up really high and it makes the um, peanut brittle, I would say, fluffier. It makes it easier to work with. It gives it some more volume. Um, and once it leaves the caramel, the copper kettle and comes out to the table out here, we flip it and pour it on the table and we hand stretch all of our brittle. So the table that you're seeing now is what we call a water fed table. There is a red, um, red plumbing and blue plumbing and the red plumbing is hot water. The blue plumbing is cold water. So when we're making peanut brittle, we uh, warm up the table so it's nice and warm. And then the peanut brittle is warm when we put it on the table. And that allows us to have a lot more time to pull with it, pull it out into smaller pieces before the brittle gets too hard that we can't work with. We like to sell really thin brittle here. And so it takes probably three people to pull a batch of brittle. Um, a few minutes ago, we were in here and we'd had a batch of toffee on the table and we cool the table for toffee because it allows the table, allows the toffee to set up really nice and quick. And um, we can then take it off the table a lot quicker and move to the next piece of candy that we want to take from the kitchen. We can make between 12 to or 10 to 12, 13 on a really good day batches and of candy in the kitchen. So from the tables, um, we move over to the chocolate and rovers, is, which is where we're going to spend quite a bit of time, but why we're kind of moving over that way, because I'm a little slow on my crutches, um, we can take a few more questions. Uh, there are some questions about how, how chocolate is made, from what ingredients and where they come from. Yeah, good. Okay, I'm going to show you as soon as we get to this next spot, and we're almost there. Okay, what's your best-selling candy? Um, our best-selling candy are Buckeyes. Buckeyes, for Ohioans, know that it is um, peanut butter that we hand roll into, like, spheres every single day, and then we hand dip them every single day. Um, I think in the month of August, we did 20,000 hand rolled, hand dipped Buckeyes just for that month. So yeah, busy time around here. So um, I'm standing next to um, a cacao pod replica. And then also these are two real cacao pods. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about the chocolate process of growing it, as well as making it from bean to the chocolate form that we have. So. These are cacao pods. Um, these are real ones that are from South America. So this will then become chocolate. And cacao is grown on a tree and it's grown um, 20 degrees north and south of the equator. So between the Tropic of Cancer and the Tropic of Capricorn. 
Um, inside of this are beans and the, the beans are the seeds and that is what is ground up into nibs to become chocolate along with cocoa butter um, that comes from this and uh, for milk you add milk chocolate you add sugar so that's kind of how it's grown it's hand harvested mostly with um, people that use machetes to cut down the cacao pods off the tree um, and then it is turned into kind of crushed up turned into nibs and then turned into chocolate so at Winans we don't we don't do that process we don't take the beans and turn it into chocolate we get chocolate delivered to us in really large um, pallets that are big chunks of chocolate and that's what we use. Does that answer the question? I think so. Okay. And other than bringing the chocolate in, everything from that point forward, you do right there. Yeah, at yeah we company, do. Right? Yeah. Um, how old is your factory? So this factory that you're seeing here, we moved into seven years ago. Um, we had a very, very small factory before this. Um, and so, yeah, we've been here seven years and we have kind of outgrown it. And so we actually just have, are in the process of, we purchased the building to move our coffee operations into and so that we can expand our chocolate operations even more. Very good. How many people work at, at Winans? So for the company and all of my stores, I have about 130 employees um, total. And the production facility? Um, I would say about 20, 25. Right now you're seeing Louise and Morgan. They are loading the enrobing lines for us. We have some great people that work here at Winans. So I want to make sure that people get to see them too. Well, that brings up another question. Uh, some folks wanted to know, how did you get your job? And uh, how did you get to yeah. your current position? Okay, that's a great question. And it is um, some hard work, uh, some willingness to just kind of do whatever was asked from me and honestly showing up. So I started here when I was in college I have an undergraduate degree in social work and I was a barista in the store and I was making coffee um, when I was home on break to make some money. And I worked in the store, I worked in production at Christmas time and I would pack boxes, which you're gonna see here in a little bit. And um, honestly, like I, I'm from Piqua, I grew up in this community, Piqua High School grad. And when I moved back home after college, I, it was kind of just the right time. Um, there were two stores, but we were starting to think of expansion and it just was kind of a natural fit. And so honestly, I showed up every day to work. I worked hard and I was just willing to kind of try new things and be flexible. So if we needed somebody to learn how to do some accounting work, I did that. If we needed somebody to run a store, I did that. If we needed somebody to deliver product, I did that. So it was really just learning the business inside out as much as I could. Um, that kind of makes you valuable to a company when um, you're willing to learn all the new things. But genuinely, I like challenge. I like to do new things. And so that's kind of how I got to this role was just a lot of time and a lot of experience and a lot of being willing to do the hard work. So what uh, are there any particular skills or types of training that you look for when you're hiring people? Um, so that's a good question. So, yeah, I look for people that... Um, like to enjoy working with other people. It's an important part of, you know, work is to be a person that people want to be around. And so that is important. A person that has a good work ethic, who likes to come to work, enjoys working. Um, I think just having that kind of intangible disposition of, um, you know, you're fun to be around kind of thing, I think is important. Um, those are kind of the things I feel like I can train how to do a job, but your personality and character are just things that you kind of innately have that you can work on and you can get better at. But um, those are kind of what I look for. Very good. Thank you. Cool. All right. So we're going to talk a little bit about soy now because, um, you know, Ohio Soybean Council. So um, 
soy is not always something that people think about when they think about chocolate, but soy is used in the confection industry a lot. And um, one of the biggest ways that we use it here at Winans is soy lecithin. So soy lecithin is a byproduct of soy. And um, in confection, it is really used as like an emulsifier, a bonding agent that helps all of the cocoa solids and the milk and the sugar really attach to the cocoa butter. So that's how it's used. So all of our chocolate that you see pouring out right there in the video all has soy lecithin in it. Um, and it's, like I said, it's a binding agent. And so chocolate wouldn't look like that without it. Uh, we also add soy lecithin in a couple products and we add it into the products that have a high butter content. And that is again, to create a binding with the butter. So our cookie dough candies that we make have a lot of butter in them and our toffee that we make have a lot of butter in them. And so we add soy lecithin so that the butter does not separate from the other ingredients so that it forms nicely into the type of piece that we want. So that's a big way that we use soy in our business. Um, we're gonna talk a little bit now about kind of our process for running chocolate, um, the tempering process and what it means. So you can see the chocolate coming out now is um, in temper, what we would call it. So every night at the end of the day, they'll turn the temperature up on the machine and that breaks the temper for the day. And that um, goes back to just having regular liquid chocolate that's out of temper. And when things are out of temper, that means that the, the molecules in the chocolate are very spread out and they're very erratic. And that leads to untempered candy, which um, is dull, it's not shiny, it has a haze on it and it doesn't look good. Um, when we come in in the morning, we turn the temperature down pretty quickly and the temperature turning down and then we raise it up slow to get to the right temperature. So in milk chocolate, that sweet spot's about 86 degrees. And so once we get to 86 degrees, we can tell whether our chocolate is in temper. So in temper chocolate means that it's gonna look really shiny coming off the end of the line. It's gonna taste great. It's gonna have a good mouth feel. Um, we only temper our chocolate using temperature. So some companies may add in a wax or paraffin that helps to stabilize the chocolate and keep it in temper. We do not do that. And so that is why we have the size of belt that we do. Um, you can put, you can see there's like about four pretzels wide on there. If a company was able to use a stabilizing ingredient, they could have a huge wide belt because they wouldn't have to monitor the temperature all day. So like I said earlier, we do about 500 pounds of candy a day. And the amount of chocolate that's in the kettle at the bottom um, and in the morning is not 500 pounds, right? So we temper what's in the kettle, but to get 500 pounds, we have to add untempered chocolate. So there's a big white vat and we open it up and it drops in untempered liquid chocolate. And um, if we just added all that chocolate in at once, it would make our temperature go above 86 degrees and our chocolate, our temper would break and we would not um, have good shiny pieces. And so you can only add a small amount of chocolate at a time. So we have what's called a drip feed going where there's about um, a pencil sized drop that's going in at a time. Um, and like a pencil tip size drop going in at a time. And that's how it stays in temper all day. Um, we also have a piece of equipment that, oh, you're going to get to see Louise drop some in. So that is untempered chocolate. So it's going into the trough like that. And then from the trough down below, you probably won't be able to see it. It's on the back side, but the trough down below will um, only let so much of that in at once. So even though Louise opened the vat and dropped a lot of chocolate in, that isn't how much chocolate is going in the tempered chocolate right now. Only about a um, pencil tip amount at a time is going in. So um, we at Winans Quality is important to us. We wanna make sure we're giving our customers our very best. So we use a piece of machinery called a temper meter. And three times a day, we take that liquid tempered chocolate to the temper meter, it takes about three minutes, and then it um, prints out a report to us with a slope on it. And on the slope, it tells us whether we are under tempered or over tempered, 
And based on that report, we can come to our machine and make the necessary adjustment. So we might only have to make the adjustment of one degree. You might have to take your temperature up one degree after lunch, and that's gonna be enough to um, make the chocolate in perfect temper. So I think that that's probably one of the the bigger things, but also when I was talking about the molecules going um, a little bit like this, they were all over the place. When you get your chocolate to go in temper, they slowly line up and they make kind of a marching line and a straight line. And that is how um, you know that your chocolate is in temper. So that's kind of the science behind it. Um, it would be a lot easier to not do chocolate like this, <laughs> but um, it's why we've been successful for 60 years and it's why we'll be continue to be successful for 60 more years, I think is by sticking to kind of what got us here. Well, that's um, great, Amy. Yeah. Are I you think, ready for some more questions? Yeah, sure. Uh, do you make white chocolate? So we do make white chocolate. We have three in roving lines. And right now, two of them are in milk chocolate and one of them is in dark chocolate. But we do take the third in roving line and turn it into white chocolate sometimes. OK, uh, there are several questions related to timing, and it's probably different for different products, I would guess. But how long does it take to make your candy? Yeah, it's very different per product. So caramel took an hour where toffee may only take like 20 minutes. So it's really different depending on the complexity of what we're cooking. Do we have to cook it and then put it in the beater and beat it and form it? So there isn't really a, a set way, but none of them are over an hour. Okay. Um, we do have melt away is that cook for a while and then they have to sit in a cold room for a few hours before they're ready to work with. So that is a long, a long amount of time to wait for it to be ready, but you can do other things during that process. Do you do any testing, taste testing or other kind of testing <laughs> of your candy? Yeah, that's the best part of the job, right? Um, right. No, we do, <laughs> we do. Um, yeah, we have quality testing, but honestly, like eating it off the end of the line is the best way to just tell whether it's perfect or not. Somebody wants to know if you use corn syrup. So we do not use high fructose corn syrup, no. Okay. What's your favorite type of candy? Mm. So that changes depending on what mood I'm in. Right now I'm really into almond wordles, which is like an almond turtle. So it's almonds, caramel, and chocolate. And um, the pretzels that are running down the line are also one of my favorites. I like to snag those off the end of the belt if I'm walking by. I think that um, the taste of the candy, um, the taste and the texture, you can really tell a difference of by tempering with temperature and not with an additive. So like if you would bite into a piece of our candy compared to say a Hershey Kiss, or something you get at the grocery store, the Hershey Kiss may leave like a, a film kind of on the top of your mouth. Um, and that is that that added ingredient. It doesn't have the, as much of the good cocoa in it like we have, um, where our candy leaves a really smooth finish on your mouth. And that is because it is just pure chocolate. Okay. I'm gonna head down this direction, but I can take a couple more questions while I'm going okay. this way. Uh, this is an interesting question. Uh, one of the teachers, her class would like to know what kind of wages do you pay and are they paid hourly? Uh, that's a good question. And it depends what job that you do and what kind of level of experience you've been with the company for. Um, but yeah, it's anywhere between 11, I think 11, 25, um, upward, depending on what you do. Okay. Uh, what do you, so you already said you make the most Buckeyes, right? They're yeah. the most popular. What's the lead, what's the lowest selling? <laughs> the lowest selling piece. Mm. Anybody help me? What do you think team? What's our lowest selling piece of candy? Mint Patty, maybe? 
Yeah, so mint patty is a flat mint piece. We put it in our gift boxes a lot, but it's not one that is sold on the in the stores all that much. That's a solid okay. question right now. Kind of stumped me a little bit. Yeah. I have a question okay. yeah. here. What, what causes chocolate bloom? Oh, that's a good question. So um, a couple of things. So typically, a lot of times it's called a fat bloom, and it's a fat migration from really like heavy fatty pieces that the fat is like trying to escape, and that causes bloom. Um, but it, it can also be a heat, like a humidity issue. So chocolate really likes to be in cool, low humid conditions, and that's where it thrives the best. Um, that's why Sally is cold right now, who is taking the video because it's pretty chilly in here and we keep it cold. We watch our humidity. We check our humidity multiple times a day because that will cause bloom. That's why we see more blooming of products in the summertime. Uh, we have air conditioned vans that transport our candy because um, just going from a temperature controlled area to a non temperature, non temperature controlled area outside can make a big difference in the summer. Okay. Very good. I have lots of questions, but if you need to get to the next yeah. area, please so do. Let's go to the next area and then we'll do kind of like rapid fire questions at the end so I can get to as many as possible. Okay. 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 We're going to come in to what we call the wheel room now. And we call it a wheel room because it's kind of like a chocolate Ferris wheel. Um, Long knees packing on the wheel right now. And I wanted to talk about this because this is how we get. Um, our candy into finished goods to sell in the store, right? So like we can run 500 pounds of candy off the end of the line, but until we get in a form our customers want, it doesn't matter. So um, the wheel is spinning and it has all of our different chocolates on it. And then it gets put in these gift boxes and these gift boxes then go out to our stores. Um, our stores also package their own chocolate like in the stores as well, but we do quite a bit of the packaging here um, at this location as well. So Longy is a master at the wheel. When I came, was in college and I had told you I was working on my breaks, this is what I did is I would stand at the wheel and there was like a list that you had to get so many done in an hour. So this is kind of where my big break happened was on the wheel, I guess. So um, I did want to talk a little bit about the packaging. So you can see some black boxes right here that have our logo on them. This is just one of the packaging items that we use. Um, we do buy that packaging here in Ohio. It's an Ohio company in the Cleveland area that we get it from. And so I just wanted to touch on the fact that the confection industry is big, right? So you, it's not just about um, working in our candy kitchen or on one of our lines, which is great. Um, I saw, I think there were some culinary classes from um, the Career Center here in Piqua, I think was on here. And um, I love when students wanna come work for us. That's great. Uh, but there are also other dimensions that support the confection industry too. We have um, buy our boxes someplace in Ohio. And so we get them manufactured and that business stays in Ohio. Um, there are people at that company that design packaging for us. So it's not just about making the boxes, it's about the design and the packaging part of it as well. Um, so it is a pretty big part of the business, but I did want to touch on the environmental. Um, I know somebody had a question on that. And so I thought that with our packaging was kind of the best way to talk about it. So environmental efforts are something that um, is one of our big action items as a whole company right now. And we're kind of just starting every time we go to make a purchase, we try to think, can we do this in a way that is more friendly for the environment? So a couple of things that we just got in was our first shipment of coffee bags that are fully compostable. They'll probably start rolling out to the stores in the next couple weeks. Our coffee sleeves that are in the store, we just switched. Um, you may notice we used to always have brown ones with white writing, and now we have craft ones with black writing. And um, that is because they are now 100% recyclable, but they're also made from 100% recyclable materials, and they're made in a no waste factory. Um, we also are using compostable straws in our stores. Um, and every time we make a packaging purchase or a packaging decision, we are looking at different companies or we're looking at the company that we use. Do they have an 
a package that would be more friendly for the environment? Is there a different route we could go that we hadn't thought of before? So um, definitely at the forefront of our mind, we have a long way to go, but we're being very intentional and strategic about um, how we're growing. And um, yeah, I think the packaging part of it, because it's a consumer end good is probably the, the easiest way to explain what we're doing. Okay, very good. Well, I have lots of questions, as I said, Amy, so I'm yeah. just going to start sending them your way. You send them uh, my way. I'm going to come out here so I have reinforcements if I don't know the answer to the question. Maybe okay. somebody else will know the answer. While you're answering the questions, I'm going to eat one yeah. of your caramels. They're really, really yes, good, please everybody. Do. So uh, <laughs> here's a question. How do you develop new products? Yeah. Do you have any food scientists on staff? So we don't have food scientists on staff. Um, developing new products, though, is something that happens usually based on the trend of the market. So for instance, salt caramel. Salt caramel was nothing that anybody had heard of 10 years ago. And then now salt caramel is everywhere you look, right? So when the consumer demands it, we make it because that's kind of economics. And so usually that's kind of our strategy. And then oftentimes we can take one of our core recipes and we can take that core recipe and tweak it and turn it into something else that is new. Um, sometimes we do things seasonally in the summer before we've done lemon creams. We don't carry them all the time, but sometimes we do something new for fun in the summer. So yeah, it's a, um, usually it's driven by the consumer and what they want. And um, that's how we come up with them. Okay. Uh, once one teacher says her students are curious, do the chocolates going in the boxes, do they, from the wheel, do they go in a certain order? They do go in a certain order, the same order every single time. So um, yeah, we have the way that they're set up on the wheel is each tray on the wheel has four boxes on it. And that corresponds to a line um, or a row in the gift box. And so every, um, yeah, it's very intentional. And okay. it's designed so that it alternates in a specific way. Um, another classroom wants to know uh, how you work with your coworkers and are there any lessons that would be valuable in the classroom as students, as coworkers? Yeah, so my biggest thing with coworkers is kindness, right? lead with kindness and always show kindness. Um, I think that's just a good life lesson. It's a good lesson in the classroom. Um, but I think that kindness, you lead with it even when it's tough to do, even when you're kind of, you know, when you work with people, sometimes there's a rub, you get annoyed with each other, right? Um, but when you lead with kindness and when you reciprocate with kindness, then it's just a much more pleasant work environment for everyone. <laughs> and I think leading by example is really the best foremost way that you can go right um there's okay that's Very it good. that's all my answer <laughs> okay how your production facility how long does it run each day yeah so monday through thursday we run some of my crew comes in at seven and some come in at eight we run till 5 p.m so they work nine hour days monday through thursday and they work a half day on friday they're staying late for you today they usually get off at noon but they're staying late for you guys <laughs> okay and how much chocolate do you sell in your stores Ooh, on um, average golly that's a really good question a week a, week, a month a year have any i have idea? no idea you have totally stumped me i have no idea Okay. Oh yeah. You... So a good, a good thing to mention though, is like, we like ran out last Christmas. So the specialty chocolate industry is a very booming industry right now. And we like met our capacity last Christmas and our shelves were bare and we were working all the time and we couldn't keep up. And so, um, there, we still struggle with some capacity issues. Um, it's kind of going to always be the case because when you temper chocolate with chocolate, um, you can't, I can't run in May what I can sell in December. It doesn't work like that as much as I wish that I could. Um, so we are looking at some investments in cold storage and things like that, that will help us. But for now, there's only so much you can do in the time that you run it. So, okay. Uh, um, you only have the one, uh, factory, right? 
production facility? Yeah we, yeah, we only have the one factory. So we have this chocolate part of the factory and then we have another side of the building that is coffee. Um, chocolate and coffee are each, if, if you look at the year over the whole year, they're about 50-50 um, part of our business. Okay. People want to know why you're wearing that special headgear. <laughs> um, it's so I can hear you. <laughs> No, the uh, oh my ass. hair net. Your oh, hair well, net. we talked about food safety, right? Nobody wants any hair in their chocolates, right? You don't like that when you go to a restaurant and you get hair in your food. So it's the same reason here. Um, nobody wants to get hair in their chocolates. So in fact, I just the factory team down here had a meeting today, and they were just reviewing hair net wearing again because it's really an important thing to make sure that we get right. Okay, very good. How has the pandemic impacted your company? Oh, great question. Okay, so pandemic. So we were pretty fortunate in the pandemic, all told. We shut down for, I think it was five weeks here. And um, there were about four of us that stayed on and we pivoted to online and we just shipped candy for those weeks. Our stores closed for about three weeks. Um, but what we found was, um, especially in our more rural, rural communities, as soon as we opened the doors, man, people were really happy to still come in. Um, you know, the customers were really good about honoring doing wearing masks and socially distancing and doing what they had to do to get their coffee. Right. So we were fortunate. We um, did well. We had a very good quarter four, which would be October through December of 2020. And so we feel really thankful for the fact that we were able to bounce back so quickly. And I was able to retain all my employees. Oh, good. Um... Some people want to know where they could purchase their your products, and I don't know. Uh, one of my helpers may have answered the question, but generally, what parts of Ohio are you are your yeah. stores? Where are they located? So, if you're in the Columbus area, I have stores in German Village and Dublin and Grandview Yard. If you're in the Dayton, Ohio area, there's a lot, like six. So you can get lots of them. And if you're in Miami County area, we have two in Piqua two in Troy, one in Sydney, and one at the Upper Valley Medical Center. Uh, but you can also shop at winandscandies.com anytime you want. And we have buy online, pick up in store. So you can order your chocolate online and then pick it up at the location that's nearest you. And can you uh, order specific uh, types or uh, are your yeah. pound boxes all the same or you can custom order, I assume? You can custom order. So if you only wanted a one pound box of milk, sea salt caramels, you could order that online and pick it up in the store. Okay. Do you ever give tours of your factory? So yes, we did do tours before the pandemic and we would love to do tours again, but I don't know if you've noticed it's a little crowded in here now. So we have outgrown our space pretty quickly. So I do not believe we'll be doing tours again until we get the other part of our business moved into another location. It's just not gonna be safe to do tours right now with the amount of staff that I have working and the amount of people coming through the building. So we're just not able to do them right now, but hopefully next year at this time, we'll be in a better place to do them. Okay, somebody wants to know, would your chocolate harden if you go on vacation or stop stirring it? So, yeah, it would. And how, <laughs> as how, soon as how, you remove heat. And how do you clean? I assume you have to clean regularly. How do you clean the place? Yeah, so we have um, a pretty strict cleaning procedure in place for the kitchen and for the lines. And that goes back to the food safety part. So um, we have certain sanitizing things that we have to use for food grade. Everyone has checkoff lists that they've been cleaned and sanitized. You can see um, in the kitchen, they um, had some signs up by the um, sinks. And so, yeah, there's all kinds of those kind of sanitizing procedures in place. Um, we're inspected here by the um, State of Ohio Agriculture FDA as well. So we go through pretty, pretty rigorous um, cleaning and sanitizing procedures each day. Okay. Well, we're getting up close to uh, the time to end the... Uh... Uh, virtual trip today. We really appreciate all the folks that uh, joined us today. Amy, any last comments you would like to make? 
Um, I'm just really glad that you guys all came to join us today. It's been hard not being able to tour and not being able to have, um, we used to do local tours for our kids. Um, and so it's been hard not to have that kind of connection with community. Um, I think, you know, our customers and our community are really what has made us successful for 60 years. And so it's been fun to have people in, even if it's virtually, and even if it's a little strange, um, it's been fun to have everybody be able to come and join us today. So yeah, thanks. Well, we really want to thank you for allowing us to uh, come to the factory today. Uh, on behalf of Ohio's 24,000 soybean farmers, the Ohio Soybean Council, our partners in education, educationprojects.org, and our web platform, grownextgen.org, we really appreciate you participating today. Uh, Go to grownextgen.org for your resources. There will be a recording of this for people who want to replay it, or if you had to join late or you want to show it to other classes later, that link will be provided. We appreciate it. Also for you teachers and students out there, we will be sponsoring a harvest video tour of farms showing uh, harvesting of soybeans and all the technology and things associated with that. Those will be October 13th and 14th, and you can sign up on grownextgen.org. Again, thank you for participating. It was a great tour. Thanks, Amy. Thanks, Winans. And I'm going to eat another piece of candy. So thanks, everybody. Have a great day.